the Dead Man by Georges Louis Borges. But a man from the outskirts of Buenos Aires, a sad sort of hoodlum whose only recommendation was his infatuation of courage, should go out into the wilderness of horse country along the Brazilian frontier and become a leader of a band of smugglers. Such a thing would, on the face of it, seem impossible. For those who think so, I want to tell the story of the fate of Benjamin Otolora, whom no one may remember any more in the neighbourhood of Balvanera, but who died as he lived, by a bullet in the province of Rio Grande do Sul. I do not know the full details of his adventure. When I am apprised of them, I will correct and expand these pages. For now, the summary may be instructive. In 1891, Benjamin Otolora is 19 years old, a strapping young man with a miserly brow, earnest blue eyes, and the strength and stamina of a Basque. A lucky knife thrust has revealed to him that he is a man of courage. He is not distressed by the death of his opponent, or by the immediate need to flee the country. The ward boss of his parish gives him a letter of introduction to a man named Azevedo Bandera over in Uruguay. Otolora takes ship. The crossing is stormy, creaking. The next day finds him wandering aimlessly through the streets of Montevideo with unconfessed and perhaps unrecognized sadness. He doesn't manage to come across as a Vito Bandera. Toward midnight in a general store by in Paso del Molino, he witnesses a fight between two cattle drovers. A knife gleams. Otolora doesn't know whose side he should be on, but he is attracted by the pure taste of danger, the way other men are attracted by gambling or music. In the confusion, he chucks a low frost meant for a man in a broad brimmed black hat and a poncho. That man later turns out to be Azevedo Bandera. When Otolora discovers this, he tears up the letter of introduction because he'd rather all the credit be his alone. Though Azevedo Bandera is a strong, well-built man, he gives the unjustifiable impression of being something of a fake, a forgery. In his face, which is always too close, there mingle the Jew, the Negro, and the Indian. In his air, the monkey and the tiger. The scar that crosses his face is just another piece of decoration, like the bristling black moustache. Whether it's a projection or an error caused by drink, the fight stops as quickly as it started. Otolora drinks with the cattle drovers, and then goes out carousing with them, and then accompanies them to a big house in the old city. By by now the sun is high in the sky. Out in the back patio, the men lay out their bedrolls. Otolora vaguely compares that night with the previous one. Now he is on terra firma. Among friends, he does, he has to admit, feel a small twinge of remorse about not missing Buenos Aires. He sleeps till horizons, when he is awakened by the same paisano who had drunkenly attacked Bandera. Otolora calls that this man has been with the others, drunk with them, made the rounds of the city with them, that Bandera sat him at his right hand and made him keep drinking. The man tells him that the, the, the boss wants to see him. In a kind of office that opens off the long entryway at the front of the house, Otolora has never seen an entryway with doors opening off it. As Avedo Bandera is waiting for him, with a splendid, contemptuous, red-haired woman, Bandera heaps praise on Otolora, offers him a glass of harsh brandy, tells him again that he looks like a man of metal and asks him if he'd like to go up north with the boys to bring a herd back. Otolora takes the job. By dawn the next morning, they are on their way to Tacorembo. This, that is the moment at which Otolora begins a new life, a life of vast sunrises and days that smell of horses. This life is new to him and sometimes terrible, and yet it is in his blood, for just as the men of other lands worship the sea and can feel it deep inside them, the men of ours, including the man who weaves these symbols, yearn for the inexhaustible plains that echo under the horse's hooves. Otolora has been brought up in neighborhoods full of cart drivers and lever braiders. Within a year, he has become a gaucho. He learns to ride, to keep the horses together, to butcher the animals, to use the rope that lassoes them and the bowl that bring them down, to bear up under weariness, storms, cold weather, and the sun, to herd the animals with whistles and shouts. Only once during this period of apprenticeship does he see Azevedo Bandera, but he is always aware of his presence, because to be a Bandera man is to be taken seriously, in fact to be feared, because no matter the deed of manly strength or courage they see done, they see done, the gauchos say Bandera does it better. One of them says he thinks Bandera was born on the other side of the Coraim in Rio Grande do Sol. Do Sol. In that fact, which ought to bring him down a notch or two in their estimation, lends his aura a vague new wealth of teeming forests, swamps, impenetrable and almost infinite distances. Gradually, Otolora realizes that Bandera has many irons in the fire, that his main business is smuggling. Being a drover is being a servant, Otolora decides to rise higher, decides to become a smuggler. One night, two of his companions are to cross the border to bring back several loads of brandy. Otolora provokes one of them, wounds him, and takes his place. He is moved by ambition, but also by an obscure loyalty. Once and for all, he thinks, I want the boss to see that I'm a better man than all these Uruguayans of his put together. 
Another year goes by before Otolora returns to Montevideo. They ride through the outskirts, and then through the city, which seems enormous to Otolora. They come to the boss's house. The men lay out their bird rolls in the back casio. Days go by, and Otolora hasn't seen Bandera. They say, timorously, that he's sick. A black man takes the cattle and mate up to him in his room. One afternoon, Otolora is asked to carry the things up to Bandera. He feels somehow humiliated by this, but derives some pride from it too. The bedroom is dark and shabby. There was a balcony facing west, a long table with a gleaming jumble of quirts and bullwhips, cinches, firearms and knives, a distant mirror of cloudy glass. Bandera is lying on his back, dozing and mo moaning some. A vehemence of last sunlight spotlights him. The last white bed... The vast white bed makes him seem smaller and somehow dimmer. Otolora notes the grey hairs, the weariness, the slackness, and the lines of age. It suddenly galls him that it's this old man that's giving them their orders. One frost, he thinks, would be enough to settle that matter. Just then, he sees in the mirror that someone has come into the room. It is the red-headed woman. She's barefoot and half-dressed and staring at him with cold curiosity. Bandera sits up. While he, while he talks about things out on the range and sips mate after mate, his fingers toy with the woman's hair. Finally, he gives Otolora leave to go. Days later, they receive the order to head up north again. They come to a godforsaken ranch somewhere, that could be anywhere, in the middle of the unending plains. Not a tree, not a stream of water soften the place, the sun beats down on it from first light to last. There are stone corrals for the stock, which is longhorned and poorly. The miserable place is called El Suspiro, the Sigh. Otolora hears from the peons that Bandera will be coming up from Montevideo before long. He asks why, and somebody explains that there's a foreigner, a would-be gaucho type, that's getting too big for his britches. Otolora takes this as a joke, but he's flattered that the joke is possible. He later finds out that Bandera has had a falling out with some politico, and the politico has withdrawn his protection. The news pleases Otolora. Crates of firearms begin to arrive. A silver washbowl and pitcher arrive for the woman's bedroom, then curtains of elaborately figured damask. One morning, a somber-faced rider with a thick beard and a poncho rides up, rides down from up in the mountains. His name is Ulpiano Sores. He is Azevedo Banderas Capanga, his foreman. He talks very little, but there is, and there is something Brazilian about his speech when he does. Otolora doesn't know whether to attribute the man's reserve to hostility, contempt, or mere savagery, but he does know that for the plan he has in mind, he has to win his friendship. At this point, there enters into Benjamin Otolora's life a sorrel with black feet, mane, and muzzle. Azevedo Bandera brings the horse up from him, up with him from the south. Its bridle and all its other gear is tipped with silver, and the bindings on its saddle are of jaguar skin. That extravagant horse is a symbol of the boss's authority, which is why the youth covets it, why he also comes to covet, with grudgeful desire, the woman with the resplendent hair. The woman, the gear, and the sorrel are attributes, adjectives, of a man he hopes to destroy. Here, the story grows deeper and more complicated. As Evedo Bandera is accomplished in the art of progressive humiliation, the satanic ability to humili humiliate his interlocutor by little by little, step by step, with a combination of truths and evasions, Otolora decides to employ the same ambiguous method for the hard task he has set himself. He decides that he would gradually push Azevedo Bandera out of the picture. Through days of common danger, he manages to win Sora's friendship. He confides his plan to him, and Sora's promises to help. Many things happen after this, some of which I know about. Otolora doesn't obey Bandera, he keeps forgetting, improving his orders, and even turning them upside down. The universe seems to conspire with him, and things move very fast. One noon, there is a shootout with men from Rio Grande do Sul on the prairies bordering the Tacarembo. Otolora usurps Bandera's place and gives the Uruguayans orders. He is shot in the shoulder, but that afternoon Otolora goes back to El Suspiro on the boss's sorrel, and that afternoon a few drops of his blood stain the jaguar skin, and that night he sleeps with the woman of the shining hair. Other versions change the order of these events and even deny that they all occurred on a single day. The Bandera is still nominally the boss, he gives orders that aren't carried out. Benjamin Otolora never touches him out of a mixture of habit and pity. The last scene of the story takes place during the excitement of the last night of 1894. That night, the men of El Suspiro eat fresh butchered lamb and drink bellicose liquor. Somebody is infinitely stumming at a milonga that he has some difficulty playing. At the head of the table, Otolora, drunk, builds exultancy upon exultancy, jubilation upon jubilation. That vertiginous, dinuous tower is a symbol of his inexorable fate. Bandera, taciturn among the boisterous men, lets the night take its clamorous course. When the twelve strokes of the clock chime at last, he stands up like a man remembering an engagement, stands up and knocks softly on the woman's door. She opens it immediately, as though she were waiting for the knock. She comes up barefoot and half-dressed. 
In an effeminate, wheedling voice, the boss speaks in order. Since you and the city slicker, they are so in love, go give him a kiss so everybody can see. He adds a vulgar detail. The woman tries to resist, but two men have taken her by the arms, and they throw her on top of Otolora. In tears, she kisses his face and his chest. Ul Piano Sores has pulled his gun. Otolora realizes, before he dies, that he has been betrayed from the beginning, that he has been sentenced to death, that he has been allowed to love, to command, and win, because he was already as good as dead, because so far as Bandera was concerned, he was already a dead man. Sores fires, almost with a sneer.